I, I couldn't even get anything. I couldn't say hello. I was just like, Coleman, it is your time. It is your time. Because what I witnessed, and by applause, what I'm clearly seeing, they all witnessed, is just someone illuminating somebody giving so much of themselves. So thank you for that, Coleman. Thank you so much. And I want to use that word time maybe to start this conversation because I think, you know, we have two people, right? We have the individual who's like, about damn time that we're seeing this recognition. And we have some people that's like, wow, he's done this in such a short amount of time. And we're in Hollywood, you all. We all know that nothing happens that fast and nothing happens without a lot of love and highs, but also perceived lows because I believe they're really preparation. And I would love for you, Coleman, to just talk about how your cumulative time over the 30 year, and he's only 10, y'all, over the 30 year <laughs> career that has supported you into portraying this masterful art that you just did. Well, first of all, thank you for that. Uh, just thank you. I am filled with such gratitude even just to be here because uh, I know that it's been a, such a windy road to this film. I've been working, you know, from, I started my career uh, when I was 21 years old, uh, and I moved to San Francisco from Philadelphia, and I just wanted to be a, I just wanted to be a theater artist, and I wanted to, um, I don't know, I, I would be frustrated sometimes with the things that I was auditioning for, so I became a writer, and I wanted to write the work, and then I directed the work started theater companies. And I just wanted to be, I, I, was, I was on the road to being a journeyman. At, at times I was on the road to be an artistic director of a theater. That's where I played, that's where I felt very useful. I felt like I could change people in the theater in dark spaces, you know? And, and then I wanted to think about the kind of men that I wanted to portray and the way I wanted people to see them in the world. You know, these men that look like me and, I sh and I'm able to show all these different shades of humanity through um, what I believe is what one of, my, one of my teachers told me when I was 19. He said, I think this is your gift. And, and I ran with it because I'd never been told that I had a gift. And I thought, well, this feels, I guess, purposeful. And um, so my, my, my course has always been from just wanting to serve the work and create the work and let it be there. And that's, that's why I've always been a multi-hyphenate. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna get in where I fit in. What, what do you need? What, what, what does this production need? You need an actor, director, writer, producer, I'll do it. Stagehand, you name it. So I think that that's honestly, because I've been doing all of that work for so long, and my career went from San Francisco to New York and London for a while, and, and then eventually, you know, you have highs and lows, and I tell anyone who's ever watching all this light on me right now, just go back 10 years, go back 15, <laughs> go back 20. It wasn't always that bright. You know, it was um, starvation times. There was rebuilding, rethinking, leaving. There was all these side hustles and there was never any promise to sit here. But I was on the journey of being an artist. And so I think that's the commitment that I made. That like, my success was always based on what I believed my success was. It wasn't based on what, you know, the world says being successful. Yeah. The light was always on you, Coleman, because it was in you. Mm. That's the difference. When it's on you, that can turn off. But what's in you, Sean, you gonna make turn off every day. So. That's what I came here to do. That's what I came here to do. <laughs> I'm a very sensitive person, so uh, that's it's a superpower that we get we get we get a chance to see and you know you you mentioned journeyman and you also had your master's in journalism i'm really curious as to how you as an archivist as an artist as an activist research for a role like this because i didn't see him mimicking Bayard Rustin i saw you take the soul of what i believe his character was and shared him with us and so I would love to just understand your process as it relates to research, to really ground yourself in the work. Thank you. Well, the first thing, the moment that I knew that I was going to do this, I had a choice to either be completely terrified or go to work. 
Then I went to work. I, went, I had five months ahead of me, so I went to deep preparation. That's what, I think maybe that's a journalistic heart of mine. I'm just very curious about everything, so I want to know everything. And not just what's on the page, everything around it. So I want to learn everything from the time frame of, you know, where, where is he in 1942, where is he in 1963, what are they eating, what's on the radio, <laughs> you know what I mean? Making all decisions about everything, about like, you know, I look at imagery, I look at, you know, any of his writing, anything that I can find of a writing, I would go to the Schomburg, I would, you know, go to civil rights museums, I would, and then, so I would interrogate everything around it, because I feel like that's a part of my work, to find out all this stuff that y you may not know it, but you will feel it in some way, that I know it, that I know how, it how what, what makes sense of how he sits, how his clothes are fitting, how he uses his hands, um, his body language. I feel like he moves different than I do, and he moves differently in different spaces. So that's from imagery, that's also from, uh, you know, listening to uh, any interview or, or debate that he had and finding out the way he spoke, which was with this mid-Atlantic standard accent that, he, that was of his own creation. <laughs> he was kind of a dope, dope person for that, right? You know, he's like, he's like you know, I mean, you know, I'm such an outlier. I'm even going to give myself an, my own accent, you know? In 1963, where people really don't want his presence in rooms, but he's like, you're going to have all of me and an accent. <laughs> exactly. And so, he, right? He was so fantastic in that way because he was very undaunted. He was really, he was really in his own making. And say so everything, all his ideas and his curiosity, the way he loved, you know, traveling and, 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 and all the different teachings, whether it's of Gandhi or, or, or the Bible, you name it. But he, he was a sponge and took in everything. Thing. So I wanted to take in all of that as well. I took in everything that he took in so I can create a bit of it, more of his spirit. And I think that the thing, the thing that I love that you said, that was the most important thing to me. I was like, you know, if I actually, I think, played by Rustin the way Bayard actually was, it would seem like a caricature, I think. Because he you know, had this very thin, high, weedy voice. He played the lute and sang Elizabethan love songs. He had a tenor voice. He was, he was an incredible personality, but his voice was like pitched even a bit higher, a bit higher up here. And, like, you know, and he spoke with very, you know, great elocution at times. And it was like, that's a lot for people. <laughs> so George C. Wolf, my brilliant director, and I, we found a middle ground where we found it sustainable and honest and organic and still connected to me. Not, not, not something I'm reaching for that's outside of myself, but some, finding that buyer that lives in me. So that was all the work that it took. And it took about a good five months of that. And I really, I always take myself through a rigorous rehearsal period because that's just what I need so I can feel free. I needed to learn all my speeches. I'm pretty much in every page of this script, so I needed to know a lot. Because also, the thing that I knew I needed to do was have the spirit and the energy to lead the set as well. It, it's not, it's, I don't think it's, I've seen some, I'll just, how, how can I say, on a film like this, I think you need all of these elements of the character and the story and all your research and all that, but it can't, you can't be insular about it because you still have to guide and guide everyone, every, every single department, every, they have to, you have to, so I had to guide it in a way that I believe Bayard would. You know, how do you rally everyone? and make sure that every single person that comes in, every background actor, every bit of transpo, every grip, to know that this was what, this is the film. This is what, this is why you're doing it. This isn't just a gig, you know? So I think that there was levels of all of that, and so it, that continued through production um, of How to Lead as well. Come get interview, hit the info. Um, <laughs> but what I, what I love is that you mentioned about that. <laughs> But no, he really good. But because you, you're going into what I wanted to talk about, which was I know your your time in theater, um, because you are a journeyman and have done so much. Um, you were always equity deputy. Yeah. Explain to, explain to those who don't know what equity deputy is. Okay. Who knows what an equity deputy is? All right. Who's been an equity deputy? Who loves to be an equity deputy? Nobody usually. Okay, except me and you. Okay, get this. In the theater, my friends, there's always the first day of rehearsal when you're in actor's equity, you have to choose um, an, an equity deputy. And you don't get a badge or anything. You just basically, you get burdened with the responsibility of taking care of the well-being of not only the company, bringing any issues up that you think may be violating any issue, uh, union issues, and you bring them to your producers. You're sort of the middleman in that way. So 
usually, and I, I, I have a long career in the theater, and every first day of rehearsal, someone, you can vote, and you, you can say, oh, I'd like to be, or someone nominates. And someone always says, I nominate Coleman Domingo. <laughs> and at first I was like, oh, okay. And somebody seconds it, and then you're like, okay, I guess I'm deaf for you. And then it, made, it started to, I, I didn't know why it was always my job. But it seemed to start to make sense. Now, maybe 10, 15 years later, when they're like, hey, who's gonna be, I said, I got this. <laughs> so I didn't even know, but then I started to understand that I actually had a skill. It was a great skill of mine, of diplomacy. And really being able to hear all sides and say, okay, and advocate for each other. I always advocate, I understand my producers are my partners. You know what I mean? And I'm like, oh, I know how to advocate for the, all the actors and all, anyone else who yeah. needs something. And because I, I believe, in my core, that we're, we're trying, we all want the same thing. We just have to find a way to hear each other. So I knew that those, oh, thank you. <laughs> so I knew I needed that. So I, I, I'll tell you this, I don't, I don't know if I would have been ready for this role maybe <coughs> 10, 15 years ago. I needed those 30 plus years mm -hmm. to do this work, because mm. it was gonna require not only my skills as an actor, but my leadership skills. Mm and the skills that I, that I think that I needed to have. And by the way, the craziest thing is this. I found out um, Byron Russell was 51 years old when he organized the March of Washington. And I found out when I met with Gail King on CBS this morning, she said, how old were you? And that's the one thing, as much as research as I've done, I didn't remember, I was like, well, I didn't think about that. And I was 51 years old when I did this film. So, in some cosmic way, yes, I needed all those years to be at that age to do that work. The same as Bayard, yeah. And Coleman, talk to me about, because I think Coleman, I think collaboration. And I think about the decisions, you know, um, you know, Bayard Rustin wanting, him wanting to wear blue, right, and what that represented. And talk to me about your collaboration with some of the other department heads, with makeup and hair, to really fully immerse in that world, production design. I'm really, really curious how you all work in that tandem in that space. The most beautiful thing about this collaboration is that I was, a, I was really privy to so much more than usual. And I think that that was very useful. I would, you know, with Mark Rucker, our fantastic production designer, he would make sure that he would show me uh, what, and ask me questions about of the, the vinyl albums that are sitting by the record player. And I, because he knew that I needed to know exactly what they were and I had to have a connection to them. So there's Mahalia there, there's, there's James Brown, there's all these different things that are there, which is great, that only, that we know, but it helps me in performance as well. So even like the way Byard's apartment looked, you know, they made sure the detail of that was just like Byard's apartment in, in Chelsea. And so all of that, so we, we and they would allow, you know, I would go in, you know, the moment it was the set was being dressed and everything, and I would I would play and lay in the bed and move around and make sure that it was as organic as possible because I know that was helpful for George as well. So he would say, "Okay, so um, George speaks very fast. So, so, so what, what, what would you say?" I, I you know, and I'm like, and I would have a, an idea. I think I think I was sitting in my chair here in the scene here. Is this chair is from India, and you know, I, I, we can make decisions that you know that give it all the texture. And then um, the thing that was really great was the costume and hair discussions because we had levels to it of, of how much, because Byers' hair at times was very, like, in his later years, shocking white. And it was always a little, sometimes it was a little a little messed up. He, he wasn't the brother that was polished like, you know, <laughs> Martin Luther King or, you know, Ralph Abernathy. He wasn't these Southern Christian brothers. He was a bit of a hippie at times. So there, so times where it's just a little, you know, you tell like, oh, you didn't get a real good haircut. <laughs> so like, so I think actually, to be honest, I would actually like sometimes when it's kind of perfect, I would like sort of mess it up a little bit. <laughs> you know, that was my own little secret. I'm like, I don't think it's that perfect that it's seen. He should look a little frayed when he takes the glasses off. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So for me, that was all like for me, like all the stuff, and we we really talked about every ounce of that. And then I wore. Prosthetics. I do have my own teeth, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was. I had to wear prosthetics for the upper, my upper teeth here, because he lost uh, two or three, and then we. And that's. We had a version of it that had green screen, but then when we started in rehearsal, but then we're like, oh, that's. We just thought it was a little distracting for my fellow actor, so we went with a black mat here, and then the rest is really done like a little CGI to make sure you can see to my tongue. 
Bible. So that's, if, that, if you're wondering how that happened, <laughs> that's how it happened. But I would put those bad boys in like an hour and a half before because I had to work with them. Because as you see, I speak with alacrity. And it's just, uh, and I, it's a lot of words to chew. So I had to get my mouth prepared for that because you have to, I had an impediment. And, and also, it also gave him a very slight lisp which I actually have a very, very slight list, but he also had a slight list. So that was awesome. So now I can, so I'm like, oh yeah, that naturally will happen. So um, we made decisions on all of that. And then also with the costume department, I love working with Tony Leslie James because she really, we really discovered a few things together, especially like how he feels in certain spaces. Like how Bayard is, I think when he's in spaces, when he's trying to, when he's his, his freest self and himself, I think his suits are cut a little differently. So his arms can open wide and a bit freer. Or he, when he's standing in a room with the NAACP in that black suit in the very beginning after he hands that letter to Martin, his suit is a little bit more tight and he's trying to, and even the, the structure of the suit is actually not him. He's trying to conform. He's trying to be like everybody else. Otherwise you see him in a very light suit or gray or his tie undone. That's the, the buyer that we were like, in all his images, he was the guy who had his tie undone and his sleeves rolled up. Because, and for me, that says a lot about him, especially at that time. He was such an outlier and he was not, he was not able to just, he was like not concerned about that, about image. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think that's why he was being his fullest self mm -hmm. at all times, which is also a challenge to most people. Because, mm -hmm. you know, put your tie up, you know, yeah. fix it, you know. Mm -hmm. This is the way we need to look as a, as a collective as we're trying to march towards freedom. And he's like, I march towards freedom with my intelligence, my wit, and my humor, and my heart. I think. He was kind of dope. <laughs> and you know, Coleman, I, I hear that and I think about like the decisions that are made, but also the responsibility that one might feel to you know, bring someone whose work we are all intimately familiar with, the March on Washington, but not intimately familiar with the details and the complexities of how it come together. And because he was his full self, he some could say maybe that's why he wasn't a part of or erased from history, you know, really being in the forefront. I didn't learn about him the way that we know about Martin Luther King, the way that we know about other individuals. What responsibility did you feel as you were bringing his, his full story to light and to love um, as, a, as a creative, as an artist, but as an archivist and as someone who's a journalist himself? Like, what responsibility did you feel to bring this character to us? So beautifully, by the way. Thank you. I, I felt the responsibility to, he, he was someone I found out about when I was about 19 years old in school. And I thought that, you know, as a, as a kid trying to navigate his own way through the world and how to be in the world, I stumbled upon Bayard Rustin in like within, in an African American student union that I joined at Temple University. And we were talking about the March on Washington and his name came up and I was like, oh, that's curious, never heard about him. I went, you know, we, I learned about the March on Washington and Dr. King and all and all these other leaders, but I'm like, well, why haven't I heard about Bayard Rustin? And then I go, oh, he's openly gay. Okay. And then it started, then I had to start to almost, you know, rewrite the history. I had to, you know, interrogate more and find out more. And like, how is it possible that he, he's, he's so profound and prolific? Anyway, so because I had that as sort of a North Star for a long time, it just, just imagine, throughout my career, there's been at least maybe four or five occasions when the pe people who know about Bayer Rustin feel they feel like a secret society, <laughs> and every so often somebody's like, "Hey, you know what? Whatever they're doing, a, a biopic about Bayer Rustin has got to be you." I'm like, "Oh, thank you. Okay, I, and thank you." And then years later, somebody else would say, "They've got to do one, and you've got to do it. You've got to write it. You've got to do it." So people have been telling me this for many years, and I didn't know exact. I kind of knew. I was. I was like, "I can see that. I can see. I think I can see why." Or, and then by the time I was offered this, I knew that I had everything in me to access it. I don't think this way about every role or anything, but I knew that I knew that I was the one, and I knew that I was ready for this responsibility, and I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take it lightly. I, it's very meaningful, especially for these rare depictions of. Um, people in our community mm -hmm. to be seen fully. Not just his intelligence, but we bring his sex into it. Mm. We bring in his joy, his laughter, his humanity. We even bring in his messiness with relationships. 
So we build a real full human being to make sure that he's so full. And I knew that was, that was the task and that was the opportunity. And so I thought, and I, really, I truly thought this, I thought if this is the last film that I ever do, I wanna give everything I could to it. Because it's that meaningful and it's about, if you get an opportunity, and I'm sure every actor in this room would want that, that opportunity to portray one of your heroes and give your whole heart and soul to it, you will do it. And you will, you will stay up and you will rehearse yourself 50 hours a week and you will, will go to sleep and wake up thinking about it. You will go across the country and leave your partner and all that stuff. And you will do it because you know that that's, a, that's the greatest opportunity you can ever receive as an artist. Now, I've done other movies after that, which is a blessing. And I feel like now I take a bit more of this whole experience with me because it was, it was, and maybe that's it, I was, I was so happy to have this responsibility. You know, just so thrilled that, that somebody, and I believe it was Bayer, tasked me to tell his story. What, what a blessing. I mean, that's, I mean I'm, I'm still so full with it. And I, and I tell you, I just get emotional because it's, it's just a beautiful thing. And I'm so happy that it's been seen. I'm gonna do two quick questions. Um, some of the scenes in here uh, make me emotional. You know, we see young Ruby, um, we see Bayard on the on the bus, and for you, as as a a vulnerable, powerful, emotional, creative, and artist, were there any scenes for you that just were like, because you're playing history, but there's some parallels to present as it relates to injustice. And I'm just curious for you, was there ever a moment in those scenes where you're like, wow, this actually happened? You know, this moment, how he lost his teeth even, you know? And so I'm just curious for you from that, from an emotional place. I, I, I'd like to, I can talk about three scenes quickly about that really always still affect me, even if I watch, you know, because I feel like there was something about it that I, maybe that I truly understood of him feeling validation, um, especially by his brothers, as an openly gay man, and you feel like you wanna be seen in your fullness, like in your rightful place, like they see themselves. That scene where um, Bayer's standing in front of the television and Martin um, sort of liberates him. And up until that point, uh, George, the way we work together, he says, he almost kept it, um, he kept it taut, made sure that Bayard's emotions were taut with every scene. He didn't get a chance to have a release. So we shot that scene pretty late into um, our shooting schedule. And suddenly he said, this is his chance to release. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that scene because we, I'm, as I needed, it needed to be about all of our release. So I looked at every single player before we did it. And just because I'm like, we have to be one in the scene as we receive this information because it's not only liberating Bayer, but it's liberating all of us and everyone who loves him as well, that we all get a release together. Because that, that's what I think that's what you know he was hoping and wishing for to be to be seen fully and not to have any shame around his life. So that that scene for me, and then I'll just say, you know, that's just this, I'll just go to the other one. The one for me. The one that really stood out to me that I love the most is one of my favorite scenes. It's the final scene where he goes and picks up trash. Yeah. It's, mm. it, and, and, I, and, and I'm always trying to dissect why it's my favorite scene. Because even when I read it, I thought, well, that's him. He just goes back to work to remember the most important thing and just keep yourself grounded in that, that that is the most important thing, is the work, and to go back to work and to do what, what you think is purposeful and what your life depends on. Yeah, you might not get the, the glow, you might not get to be welcomed into that space, but you'd make a decision in that moment. I remember George had, had the camera linger on me, he was like, 
And I said, I said, could I have, I said, could you, let's just hang in there for a minute. Because I think that there's, George and I talked a lot about this, and you didn't even ask me this question, but I'm gonna tell you guys anyway. It's all right, it's all right. We talked about moments of ma, which is, um, I think is, a, is, a, is an, an Eastern idea of like, everything's happening, nothing's happening at the same time. And just a space where it's breath. Or so, and I was like, I know that there's moments here and I feel like this is one where it's like, he, it's, it's, cause I think it's for us as well. You look at the decision of like, how does he feel? What does he recognize? And then what does he swallow? And then what does he make an agreement with? All in that little space of time. And then how do you find your purpose again and your joy and you keep going undaunted? That's, I think that for me, Maybe that's it. I think it's getting around to the question that you asked, but I feel like for me, it's inspiring that spirit that we need right now to remain undaunted with all the chaos and craziness in the world and us not hearing each other or speaking to each other and, and, and whatever's happening in the, in the world. I'm like, but to come with that spirit of love and joy and grace to remind yourself that that's why you're doing it. You know, to don't just be yelling and you know, with vitriol and, 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 and ang anger and hate, that doesn't get us anywhere. But what if you do that, arm yourself with love mm -hmm. and purpose, yeah. and, and you keep pushing with that? And I feel like that's what this film for me is. It feels like a, a clarion call to that, to remind us of that spirit, you know? So Phil, for me, that's it. I want to close with, with this part, uh, Coleman, with you finishing this sentence. I am what I am because. <laughs> I know exactly the answer. I am what I am because I've been loved. I've been loved so dearly from my family and my friends, and and uh, I think that that's what I always hope to be is love, because I think uh, that's that's the greatest thing one can be, truly. And I know I've been I've experienced such love in my life, and that's why I do what I do. That's why I do it the way I do it. Um, and I and I, and I don't compromise because I think that that's part of who I am and that's the way I want things to be. And I try to inspire others to be that way. And so to come from love, to do this work as artists, as archivists, as journalists, to come from love. Because I feel like this is, my, this is my opportunity. This is my church. This is my, where I can say, hey, I can inspire you to love more because I've been loved. I experienced that. And I want that for everyone too. If you're loved, you, you can remain buoyant in this industry. You can. I always tell any student, don't think about just doing this work without having love in your life. You need relationships, you need friendships, you need, you need all that stuff. So you can, so, cause you need all that stuff to be poured into you so you can do that with all your work. That's so, your Thank you all for being so engaged.